June 16, 1963, Croton on Hudson, a small river town in Westchester County, New York, got a front seat to history courtesy of acclaimed resident Lorraine Hansberry. While Hansberry was perhaps best known as a playwright, having been the first black woman to produce a play on Broadway with a raisin in the sun in 1959, she also blazed a path as a civil rights activist. Her activist roots took hold in Croton on Hudson, where 60 years ago she chaired an event at Temple Israel of Northern Westchester called the Rally to Support the Southern Freedom Movement. This rally took place during a time of turmoil in the United States, just two months before the March on Washington and days after President John F. Kennedy's televised report to the American people on civil rights, in which he proposed legis legislation that would later become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What follows are the oral histories of three individuals who lived in Croton Hudson during 1963 and either attended the rally or had some connection to, to or experience with Lorraine Hansberry. This documentary was con created in conjunction with Crowen Harmon High School and Lorraine Hansberry Coalition to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the rally to support the Southern Freedom Movement. It is meant to briefly capture what Crowen in America was like during the 1960s and to provide insight on what the meaning and importance of Hansberry's activism through a modern lens. Hi, I'm Seth Davis, S-E-T-H-D-A-V-I-S. Um, please describe your experience living here with us, uh, living here. What were some of your favorite memories living here? Well, lots of memories, and I, I, I have to say that the Davis family history in Croton goes back, way back to the 30s, because uh, each of my parents uh, worked as a counselor at a summer camp known at the time as Camp Rainbow. Um, later known as Camp Discovery. I drove past it today. I can't see what they call it now. They got, they got big iron gates up there. They, they don't want intruders, but it's still there. Uh, and they fell in love with the town. And, um, you know, my father went off into the war and conquered fascism and made the world safe for democracy and uh, had this dream of coming back and moving to Croton. And they did. Uh, bought a new home in 55. And um, you know, it was all People like us, uh, veterans, uh, young kids, kids my age, uh, the street I grew up on, we had tons and tons of kids my age. We could, we could, um, we could have our own baseball games with, uh, with nine on each side, just people from the neighborhood that didn't, didn't have to cross over Route 9 to get there. Croton has, has changed quite a bit since we moved here. We were, uh, like many others, we were artists who were looking for an affordable way to live. The rents in Manhattan, where we had lived before, were somewhat beyond us. We had lived in a cold water flat in Greenwich Village like many other artists. <laughs> but when we had a, expected a baby, we thought we didn't want to raise children in the city. By the 1960s, the bohemian lifestyle of New York's Greenwich Village had spilled over into Westchester County. Artists, musicians, and intellectuals flocked to Croton on Hudson, lured by its cheaper rent, its idyllic outdoor spaces, and the beauty of the neighboring Hudson River. Lorraine Hansberry and her then-husband, Robert Numeroff, were no exception. Originally from Chicago, Hansberry had been living in New York City since 1950, when she began her writing career working for Paul Robeson's progressive magazine called Freedom. But by 1961, she and Numeroff divided their time between Greenwich Village and their home in Croton, where she sheltered from the demands of city life and found solace and space to write. In her diary entry date, August 23, 1962, Hansberry wrote about Croton saying, have been here in the county for two weeks. The air and sky glisten, the wind is crisp. The night is like that beginning on a dream that will reveal the universe. So drenched in lucidity, it seems, these trees, these trees. Um, did, you, did you personally meet or know Lorraine Hansberry? Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess there aren't a lot of people left who could actually say that. Uh, so let me, let me explain the whole history. Um, Lorraine was married to a man named Robert Nemiroff. Uh, he was part of a family that was basically my, my, my parents' closest friends. 
um, but the families were very, very close. And Bob and his wife Lorraine would come up to visit them quite often. And I got, I got to meet her through that. First time I met her, I, I remember I, I'd heard about her before I met her because Raisin and the Sun opened and it was this huge, surprising success. And at the time I was maybe eight years old and was, was it really, well, certainly wasn't old enough to go in and see the, the, the play in person, but certainly success I understood. And um, she, she was a legitimate celebrity. She, she, she was writing extensively. I, I mean, the amount of works in progress and works that weren't quite finished and uh, projects that she got started on is really quite as, uh, astounding. A lot of it has been published through the work of Bob Nemiroff. Uh, and, uh, and his daughter, uh, uh, Joy Grisham, afterwards, keeping the work alive, revising past works. But she would ask my father to read drafts and, and give comments. And uh, there was a lot of exchange about what he thought about what she was writing. And, you know, especially because at this point, she, she was pushing beyond the strictly dealing with the black experience. Um, you know, you're, pr you're probably familiar now with uh, Sign and Sidney Brewstein's Window, which was her last performed work. Uh, and in many ways, the work that, that, that says the most about her. My husband and I invested in her second play, The Sign and Sidney Brewstein's Window. How this came back, that is a bit hazy in my mind. Uh, I think what happened was that uh, Sidney Poitier, the movie actor and stage actor, was a, a friend of like Lorraine Hansberry, and he also had been the had uh, did the part of, of Willie Lee, who was the main character in Raisin, and I think he helped was trying to help them raise money for the sign putting on the sign at Sidney Bruce's window. And we were living in, as I said, briefly, very briefly, in Pleasantville at the time. And he lived in Pleasantville. Somehow, they they solicited us. I, I think I, I read in the paper that she was going to be part of a big meeting at Temple Israel uh, to uh, gather funds to help uh, in the uh, effort to gain the right to vote in the South. Is there anything else uh, that stood out to you from the rally? Yeah, there was, the, the rally was memorable for a lot of reasons. Um, and as I remember, the, the, the temple was packed and uh, very, very well attended. And I don't remember a heck of a lot of what Lorraine said. She basically uh, sat up on the on the the bima, as it's, it's called during the uh, religious services, and 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 shared things. Um, but the one moment that stands out in everybody's mind was they uh, they had a um, lovely young blonde flowing haired singer named Judy Collins came and she sang a song uh, and some might have heard of her in the in the audience I hadn't uh, but she sang Blowing in the Wind and nobody had heard it before and Lorraine said to her, that's a wonderful song who wrote it and she said a friend of mine named Bob Dylan which was cool enough but the coolest thing was my father who next to whom I was sitting said oh Bob Dylan I've heard him I said, so cool that my father knew who this guy Bob Dylan was. Um, and she became pretty well known very shortly thereafter. So that, that was one, one of the highlights. Uh, but the real memorable point of, of that rally was Jerome Smith's speech that uh, he came in and he was, he was involved with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and he was able to speak 
there because he just happened to be being treated in a New York hospital for injuries that he had received in one of the altercations involved after one of the Mississippi uh, uh, demonstrations or events. And he came in wearing, he's a large man, he's wearing these overalls and, you know, the, 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 the uniform that the Mississippi activists were wearing at the time. And he basically got up there and, 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 and talked, talked about how, how awful things were in Mississippi and the things that they were trying to do. And, you know, this is, you know, what we came to hear and what we knew about. And then he started telling us about how, how things were, were, were not going to just be like this in the South, that it's going to come in the North too, that you've got problems here you're going to have to deal with. And it was like a gut punch to a lot of people that they, they had not uh, you know, thought that, you know, I guess all the... Um, the black people in Harlem were just happily doing their own thing. Well, you know, wasn't, wasn't quite so happy. And Harlem bubbled over a couple of years later and all the, 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 the city, uh, inner, inner city communities had their, their tensions. And we had to look within ourselves and, and, and um, uh, really come to grips with what this country was all about and do what we could. So what we did, what we could do was have a meeting, have some speeches, raise some money, which, which ended up uh, buying a car for them to, uh, the workers in Mississippi to use. And of course, ironically, it turned out that was the car in which the, the three workers the following year were, uh, were captured and, and, and killed. Uh, there was a special reason for us to be very much involved with this because my late husband, Bill Cotton, was a teacher at the Walden School in New York, a progressive education school. And one of his students, Andy Goodman, was one of the three. He eventually went to the South with two other young men in a car that had been bought with money at that meeting, and they were murdered in Mississippi. How would you describe the mood of Crohn directly after the riot? Pretty much unchanged. Um, I think the um, those of us who were into it uh, were more committed. Um, but you know, there there. there you know, there was still occasionally some ugliness, and, and uh, you know, uh, Ossining and Peekskill at the time had sizable African American communities, and they, you know, cer certain of my uh, my cohorts in high school used to uh, used to think it would be fun to go into Ossining on Halloween night and drive around and yell out racial epithets out the window, and um, uh, shameful. Uh, these these things would go on. Uh, that didn't go away. Uh, it's lessened somewhat. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that the Croton that my, my sons grew up in wasn't like that. Hansbury didn't know that the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window would be her last play. Throughout its production, she was sick and getting sicker. The truth was she had pancreatic cancer, but was never told. Numeroff thought it would be better if she didn't know how dire the state of her health was. Friends took up a collection while she was in the hospital to keep Sidney Brewstein running. The play closed on January 12, 1965, the night Hansberry died. She was 34 years old. Her funeral was held sometime in the middle of January in 65 um, at uh, a church in Harlem. And my parents and I went, and we went, rode on the train together in with Millie and Leo Nemiroff, uh, and it was a a really heavy blizzard that day. And um, we didn't dare even draw. We walked down from our homes uh, on Wolf Road. I guess the Nemros by that time were living in Cook Lane, which is part of the whole Riverbank community. We walked through the snow down to what was then still called the Croton Station, later called Croton North Station, later closed. Um, but it was nice and convenient for us to be able to walk to the train and somehow we managed to slide down the hill and it was one of those days where uh, there was so much snow on the ground that it almost covered up the third rail and the trains had 
difficulty making through. But some, somehow we got there, we got off at 125th Street, and we walked across to Mount Morris Park, uh, where the, uh, the funeral was. And by the time we got there, the church was packed, and we were seated I can't remember if it was in the, the, the entryway to the church or just past the entry, but we were barely inside. And Leo was one of the speakers, so he was able to go up there, but Millie and my mother and I are sat there in the back. And there was some, at, at some point after we got there, uh, there was a little shuffling in the crowd and, and a couple of men in um, overcoats Hats came in and, and stood there and clustered around. Later it turned out it was Malcolm X uh, who wanted to attend and uh, got there about the same time we did and couldn't get into the church, but he stood in the back a few feet from us. Uh, of course, I knew who he was at the time. Didn't, didn't, he was definitely trying not to be recognized. And he himself died within maybe six weeks he was assassinated after that. It was a shocking thing, but we were able to hear it all and um, my memories of the, um, the service, the, the, the passionate singing of hymns. Um, you know, Lorraine, Lorraine wasn't a religious person, but this is really a cultural thing that a lot of the, the leaders uh, in Harlem uh, had the church involved and they brought it in there and it was, became really a community thing. Uh, and Paul Robeson spoke and I, I didn't get to see him myself, but God, I heard that voice and the, um, he, his, his main focus of his speech was uh, likening his feelings to the, 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 the famous spiritual, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And he says, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And, he says, and then he says, but really I feel more like the second verse. It's sometimes I soar like an eagle in the air. Soar like an eagle in the air. And, uh, just to just be in the presence of that voice and that feeling. Um, but the one thing that I, I still feel is we, we're waiting and the main, the main, assembly came out and I don't know if it was Paul Bears or honors, honorees but Sammy Davis Jr. came walking by me and um, I exchanged a glance with him and the look of pain on his face is something that will stay with me forever. This very famous person, famous beloved actor, um, obviously feeling feeling this, 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 this pain of Someone I knew and was grieving personally uh, was, was something I won't soon forget. Um, if Lorraine Hansberry were alive today, what do you think she would say about the state of voting rights in America? State of voting? Well, she would be, she would be absolutely outraged at uh, some of the retrogression that's going on. Um, and the, the fact that we, uh, that Voting Rights Act of 65, even more important than the, the 64 Civil Rights Act. Um, I guess she, she didn't even live to see that, that come into, into law, but that was really the outgrowth of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, uh, that whole movement. I think she'd be very disappointed in the state of politics in the country today, the extreme polarity and disagreement uh, and the disrespect for facts and truth that afflicts our politics today. But on the other hand, I think she would be thrilled with the intellectual state of the African-American community and uh, for which she could take a lot of credit. But uh, the flowering of black art and literature and drama uh, and the, um, the freedom of expression that's out, that, 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 that has come to pass. And, and you know, when you look, go back and look at her speech about uh, the, the honor of, 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 of creative people being young, gifted, and black. That generation's grown up and new generations have come along and uh, they, they have, as she would have wanted, made this country better. 
she would be speaking out about all kinds of injustice that we find in different ways. Um, the, um, the Black Lives Matter movement would, would have resonated with her totally. Uh, the um, uh, women's rights movement, uh, you know, the, that, that, that really hadn't even got off the ground when, when, when she died, but she would have definitely been, been, been a part of that, and she would have been militant in that. She, she, was, she, was, she was not shy, she, was, she, was, she would not hold back, and she, she, she would be speaking her mind about all of these things but in a beautiful way, in a way that probably would have been more accepted uh, by society at, at large than some of the other people that were doing it. You know, we, we, we lost a, not just a, 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 an expressive speaker, we lost somebody with the capacity to bring people together when she died. And that, that in many ways is the biggest tragedy. A person with a view that went, went beyond uh, what, what normal people saw. I think we learned to work with each other much more cooperatively. I think we learned to come together more as a community. Uh, we always have to work on that. And I'd like, I'd, I'd like to see more of that on a nationwide basis here. And realize that we have this polarization uh, in this country. I have my certain views. Uh, it's taken me many decades to realize it, but gee, most of the world doesn't agree with me. Uh, but I've got to live in this world, and I've got to deal with people, and I need, we need to find common ground with people that don't necessarily think the same way that we do. When people are that angry at each other, uh, you fear for, you know, this, this, for for your village, you want the village to be a united village. You want neighbors to be friends with each other. You want to be pleasant with people. We we have to all acknowledge uh, that we're here because of a common purpose. It's expressed in the rule of law, which uh, I fervently will defend, uh, and. It's because of that rule of law that we've made those advances in civil rights, in social justice, uh, in our quality of life. And we have to keep at it because there are forces that would whittle that away. And uh, if good people get together and listen to each other and work together, it can be done. Throughout her life, Lorraine Hansberry stressed the importance of caring. She left a legacy of activism and compassion that continues to inspire people today. The narratives of Seth Davis, Cornelia Cotton, and Lois Waldman highlight the tremendous events that happened in Croton in the 1960s. They show that no town is safe from the events of the world, but also that people are willing and capable to stand up to injustice and rally for change. It is not enough to simply live in a community. Instead, you have to care about its future and the lives of its members. As Croton is a small village, if a person is not working for the benefit of the town, they are unintentionally working against it. This is why the 1963 rally was so powerful. The hundreds of people who attended addressed issues that affected the nation and in the process tried to make our town better as well. For change to happen, ordinary people are needed to stand up to injustice. Hansberry was not one voice, she was the voice of many. Her plays and activism spoke about equality, dreams, and compassion, themes that many people value today. Lorraine Hansberry's work and legacy is just as critical today as it was 60 years ago. It is important to recall the past and not just learn from it, but also care about the history and its impacts on the modern world. As she herself wrote, I care, I care about it all. It takes too much not to care. The why of why we are here is an intrigue for adolescents. The how is what we must command of the living, which is why I have lately become an insurgent again.